Hello, everyone. Welcome to all families, students, classrooms, science lovers who are joining us virtually to take part in this special event to celebrate Science Odyssey. I would like to begin by acknowledging the indigenous people of the lands on which we are today. While we meet today on a virtual platform, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the importance of the land which each of us call home. From coast to coast to coast, we acknowledge the treaty lands and the ancestral and unceded territory of all the Inuit, Metis, and First Nation people who are the caregivers of this land. My name is Christian Riel, and I work for a federal government agency that is responsible for making sure that researchers in Canada have the money that they need to do their work. This agency is called Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada. Now that's a mouthful, isn't it? That's why for short, we call it INSERC. So INSERC is Canada's largest supporter of discovery and innovation, and a leading promoter of science and engineering to young Canadians. INSERC is also powering Science Odyssey, Canada's national celebration of science and technology. Science Odyssey has been running since May 7th and continues until May 22nd. At which time, events of activities all over the country that are happening either online or in person. You can find a listing with all of the fun activities available during Science Odyssey on the website, which you'll find at www.sciod.ca. I encourage everyone to visit it if you haven't already. We're very happy today to be joined by Martin Lumini of Aboriginal Technologies located in Montreal. He is going to tell us about ancient fishing innovations and technologies and how science began well before laboratories and test tubes even existed. Martin is an anthropologist and an archaeologist who specializes in experimental archaeology and the reproduction of artifacts. He provides educational and scientific services for schools, museums, universities, research groups, and indigenous communities. He has even had some of his reproduction showcased on the movie Night at the Museum, Part 3. Today, through a special presentation, we are going to learn about the crafting techniques and strategies of ancient fishing instruments. I hope you're all as excited as I, as I am to discover the science behind fishing techniques and ancient, of ancient times. So uh, without any more uh, further ado, I would like to introduce Martin. Martin, to you the honor. Thank you, Christian. Well, I'm very happy to be here to talk about my favorite subject, so we're going to talk about archaeology, experimental archaeology, and fishing, of course. There are many topics we could cover, but fishing is one of my favorite. So I will be showing you objects from my collection, which are basically replicas, things that I make in order to learn, to learn what people used to do, how they used to make things thousands of years ago. A lot of things have changed. A lot of things have been lost. But archaeology tries to reconstruct the past uh, using many ways, and in my case, using experiments. So trying to do what people used to do thousands of years ago gives us a great many clues on the things they understood about science, about the landscape, about design and engineering. All those things go into fishing if you're going to feed your community. Fishing was more than just catching fish. It was about sustaining entire groups of people. So it's very serious business. So let's start uh, from the beginning. I'm going to have a few slides, a few images to show, uh, because uh, there are things that I cannot mimic, of course. There are things that are, are best seen, let's say, in context. I have a first image, which is not terribly fantastic, but uh, it shows what the starting point is. Uh, for an archaeologist, it's all about artifacts. Now, artifacts are discarded objects or lost sometimes. People uh, made things, they used them, they broke them, fixed them, recycled them, and so on, uh, but eventually discarded a lot of objects. So what we find is bits and pieces 
uh, what we call artifacts or man-made objects, most of them missing parts. What you see in the illustration is basically harpoon points and fish hooks. It's hard to recognize them because they are missing most of their assemblage. They're missing pieces, they're broken, they're degraded. Of course, organic materials degrade uh, rather rapidly in our climate. But uh, archaeologists can study them uh, with some techniques to try and understand what they are. Then there's another job to do. How did they make them? How did they use them? Now, these are technologies. They're not just tools or items. There are designs, there are concepts, there are understandings behind these objects if they are to work well. And believe me, they certainly worked well in prehistory. People are still here today to talk about it. So these are the starting point, but then we need more information. Where do we get it? Well, when Europeans arrived, they took notes, they made drawings, they, they documented uh, various things that they observed. Of course, we cannot trust uh, these uh, images and documents uh, 100%. These, were seen, these are things that were seen through the eyes of strangers who did not quite understand what they were looking at, but it gives us amazing clues. Uh, things made in organic materials like uh, canoes and nets, things that are rarely, very rarely found in uh, the archaeological record, uh, can be seen in illustrations that date back hundreds of years. So these are additional clues to understand the parts that are missing from the artifacts that we find. Uh, we even learn about species of fish that are rare today or not very important to people, but that used to be uh, very significant to ancient people in their diet. So illustrations, texts, uh, historical ones are very valuable. And of course, uh, indigenous tradition and knowledge, uh, there are still fishing practices today. Uh, the items have changed, the objects, the materials have changed, but there, are, there is much that can be learned from indigenous people from what they still use. So all, these inform all that information, all bits and pieces of a big puzzle, and replicating an object in order to experiment and to understand exactly what people were doing, say, 5,000 years ago, is all about putting all these parts together. But most of it is experimenting. There is no way today to understand how, exactly how people were using it if we don't try it ourselves. So let's start by the simplest uh, fishing tools. Uh, most people, for most people, fishing is a fishing line. You, know, you go out fishing, you have a rod, and you have a reel and you have a bait and fish hooks. Uh, that's very common, but fishing is a lot more than that. And some things haven't changed all that much, mostly the materials. Now, if we talk about fishing lines, uh, the first thing that everybody recognizes fish hooks. Now I'm gonna show you a fishing line, a uh, reproduction. Now, most people would recognize that if they looked at it carefully. It's quite big, let me show you different parts. Now, you have this part. Everyone understands what this is, I believe. It's official because it still looks like the ones we have today. Today, they're made of metal. This one is made of bone. And make no mistake, bone is very hard. This works just as well as metal. But it's attached to a line. Now, people might say, wait a minute, there's no string in ancient times. Of course, string was invented since the dawn of humanity. This is made of plant fibers. So let's follow that string. And we have, well, we have a spool here. Of course, you need cordage if you're going to go fishing. The cordage is very ancient, and there's many ways of doing that. And at the other end, there's kind of a stone here. If we look at it carefully, it has a groove. Okay, so people knew how to carve stone. And the groove is so that the string remains attached. You don't want to lose it in the water and start over again. There's also a piece of wood. It's a light wood. It was chosen specifically for that purpose. It floats. So it's a float. So you've got the spool, you've got the sinker, you've got the hook, and you've got the float. Same thing today, except it's made of metal, plastic, nylon. Now, of course, to understand how this particular type of line works, you have to try it. So when I have an opportunity, I go out on the lake, I go out in a canoe, I try to do it as traditional as possible, and I test it to see how this was used, because it certainly doesn't work exactly the same way as the one we have today. So there are many things to learn from experimenting things that are, haven't been used for a very long time, but they were used, so they are efficient. Let's go back in time. This, is, uh, this comes later in history, I believe. The oldest, most ancient fish hook could be this type. 
Now, this is found all over the world. It's just a straight piece of bone was sharpened at both ends. You can see it's tied in the middle. That's very important to design. And this is known as a gorge hook, gorge from the throat. And uh, these are found, the oldest ones are found in Africa. They're about 90,000 years old. So fishing is not new. Humans from the very beginning knew they could catch fish. They could only design proper things. So this type of hook is covered with bait. Now bait nowadays would be going to the store and buying some worms. But there were no worms in North America in ancient times before Europeans. That's new. So people would use what is most efficient. What is most efficient as bait? Well, precisely what the fish like to eat. Uh, so, so basically, fishing is observation. For thousands of years, people observed. They observed the environment, of course. They observed fish and the waterways, and they learn. This is how science works. You observe, you take notes, you learn, and then you try to design things that will work, things that are adaptive, things that are efficient, that will suit your purpose. And people learned how to use that a very long time ago. Cover it in bait, you figure out what fish is in the water, you know what bait to put, and you have a number of these tied to a main line. You throw that into a lake or a body of water, basically, where the fish are, and you leave. This is a dormant line. So basically, you just go away, you come back the next day, and what happens? say at night, bottom feeders, fish that eat from the bottom of the water, uh, will suck up their food. So if they suck their food, they swallow the whole thing, the bait and the hook. That's not exactly a hook the way we understand it. So how does that work? Well, basically, if the fish swallows the whole thing, it goes down the throat straight at first, but it's tied in the middle in that matrix because it spins and it goes across the throat of the fish. So the fish die this way. So you can just reel back the line the next day or a bit later, and you have a number of fish hooked on it. So this is very simple, and yet at the same time, somewhat sophisticated. Things have to be understood. There are principles around this. But this is not the end, just the beginning. Uh, other materials can be used. Uh, a fisherman is not just a fisherman. He uses the resources of, of the landscape, the forest. If he's going to fish, he needs out to work wood, stone and many other things because that's how his gear is made so what about wood no one would think of making a fish with kind of wood nowadays and yet it can be very efficient this is a wooden hook 100 percent wood but there are principles behind it again it's just it's not random this is a branch this is a fir tree branch two branches actually and people who know about trees would know that the crook between two branches this very section here is the strongest part of the wood. It will not break the same way that branches from trees hold very strongly. You need to fit it with a leader or something to tie it to a line, and you've got this very large hook. Uh, this would be used for pike according to ethnographic information, which means information that was collected by anthropologists, uh, say, in the past 50, 100 years. And uh, a pike is of a rather large fish. It has a big mouth, very nasty teeth. And it will eat just about anything that falls in the water, say a small bird or um, a frog. So if you know what the fish eats, you catch a frog, you tie your bait onto that, and you cast it in the water. If you know your environment, because it's your usual fishing camp, you know where the pike are. So you throw your line, and the pike will eat its prey and swallow the hook. Now, this is a very simple hook. People might say, but what keeps the fish from staying caught on this, he could just spit it out. Yes, it's true, fish have the capacity to unhook themselves, but uh, look at it carefully. There's another point here. Now, for a long time, I pondered, I wondered, why does it have two points? This is the actual hook, what is this? Well, when a fish swallows a hook, the only way to unhook himself is to back it off. But if you have another point at the other end, it's pretty hard to back up because this leans against the back of the throat. So that makes it more difficult for the fish to release itself. It acts like a bar. Modern hooks have a tiny little metal hook that prevents the fish from getting it out. This is kind of an ancient way of doing it. So this is all bone. Uh, there's also composite hooks. Now, different materials have different qualities. Wood is interesting, but it's not very durable. In water, it gets soft as well. Uh, bone is very hard. It will stay hard in water, but it's brittle. It's hard to carve. 
what if we make a hook made of both materials? But we call this composite. It's composed of many things. So you have uh, a bone point. Now it's rather easy to sharpen a bone splinter, and then you insert it a certain way in a piece of wood because wood is easier to carve. And it's much more robust than bone in terms of flexion. So you have a leader, and then you have a hook. This particular design was used uh, by Inu and Nascapi people in northern Quebec. So it's known in museums. Later in history, there were metal parts and all. It would have looked like that in ancient times. And it's apparently very efficient because they've used it for a long time. And look at that. Why is there this extended part in the bottom? I mean, you have the hook here, as we understand it. What, what is that? Why? Well, I believe it might serve the same purpose as the pike hook, a section of wood that leans against the back, the mouth of the fish, and that makes it more difficult for the fish to release. That's a hypothesis. I haven't fully tested that, but that would be one explanation, that particular part, which is really not quite necessary, but it must have been. People knew how this worked. So this is a composite hook. Well, let's go further even. Let's get fancier. If you want to get fancy, you go to British Columbia, the northwest coast. Uh, some of the world's best fishermen in ancient times, I'm sure, because they lived from the sea and they designed many kinds of hooks, including this one. It's made of stone, a stone that can be carved, slate. And the point is bone. That's always best. It's lashed together. But why bother make a hook out of stone when you can use wood or bone or something else? Well, stone is heavy, right? So if you don't want to bother to have a separate weight on your line, there you have it. You have a hook with that it's its own, its own weight. And there's a clever way to use this. Uh, documentation shows that uh, hooks like these were used in specific uh, areas at specific times when salmon is rather aggressive and will tend to attack or jump on things that move in a specific way. So you put bait on that. And let's say you tie this a long line at the end of your paddle. You can see it in the image and you go on for a stroll. But as you are moving your paddle, you are moving the hook. It might look a bit aggressive and salmon will run after it and catch it. So that is one specific way of trolling uh, a fish hook. And there is a specific design for that. So fish have their own behavior and that behavior changes around the year, depending on the spot, on the season, so it's, uh, it's very complex to understand how to catch fish all the time, every time. You have to understand how they move, how they change, what they eat and adapt. And so these tools are very well adapted, adapted to various circumstances. We can go even fancier than that. Again, we're going to stay on the West Coast here. And this hook is uh, often seen in museums. Oh, they made a great many of them. Many were collected. They're still made today in... Uh, decorative fashion. It's a work of art, you might say. And uh, yes, it is indeed a work of art. But hundreds, thousands of years ago, this was feeding families. It's very large. This is actually a halibut hook. A halibut is a very large fish, two to three meters. Uh, of course, in ancient times, two meters might be big enough for your canoe. So it's made of wood, composite, two pieces of wood lashed together. Oh, now you have a different system. It's getting complicated. There is a bone barb right here. That's lashed as well. And uh, well, this is the leader. This is how it's tied to the line. But I'm holding it this way because that's how it works, really. Now, these two woods, these two pieces of wood are not made of the same wood. That, there's a purpose to that. You see, the halibut is a rather strange fish. It starts its life as an ordinary fish. And then eventually it turns flat ways. And the mouth stays perpendicular. So its mouth opens quite the opposite way of other fish. And it also has the capacity to expel hooks. It can unhook it and expel it. So this is a V-shaped design. You wrap squid around this part here. This is what the halibut likes to eat. And so the hook holds this way in water. It's weighted by a heavy rock. It's, it's rather near the bottom, actually. And the halibut comes. And you can imagine he bites on that part. You can see that on the old hooks in museums. They have teeth marks all over the wood. This part is decorated, usually. If you're going to fishing for a two meter fish in a canoe, uh, you might want to add something symbolic, something that might help you. 
So there is a symbolic aspect to these hooks. I won't go into those details, but uh, basically this is heavy wood. This is light wood. So if you put it in water, it's going to float this way. Physically speaking, that's the way it floats. And it's in the perfect position for the halibut. So this design was experimented for a long, long time uh, in order to come up with this perfect situation to catch halibut fish. So this is another example of physics and biology coming together, people making observations about nature thousands of years ago, and then implementing those observations, turning them into technologies that were very efficient. Now, uh, you need weights too. I'll show you two types of weights. Uh, there's this type, which is very popular all over the world, really. It's a rock. Well, it's a round rock. It was chosen this way. It was grooved so that a string called all the rock you could hold on to. And uh, this other type here is found only in Eastern Canada and North America. It's very interesting, elongated. Supposedly, it was tied this way. So what's interesting about weights is that they're not just rocks. They actually have different time periods. The oldest ones we know are shaped like this. This is very fancy. And the simplest ones come later in history. We have this idea that technology gets more complex over time. Maybe that's how it works in our society, but in ancient times, uh, complexity and efficiency don't necessarily go together. You can have very efficient weights uh, and have them very simple. So things tend to change from this to this over time. We don't have clear explanations of why exactly. And I'm gonna show you cordage. That without cordage, there is no fishing. Uh, I always say that the three first things that were developed by humanity was the mastery of fire, of course, uh, flint napping to make sharp stone tools, but also cordage. The only trouble is that cordage is organic, it disappears, and we rarely find any. But surely, uh, how can you live without cordage if you don't have glue, nails, screws? So cordage is very basic and yet very complex at the same time. Show you a bit of a demonstration. Now you can make cordage out of many things. Anywhere in North America, there is at least one plant that will make cordage, but there are different ways of doing that. This is elm bark. Elm grows uh, plentiful where I'm at, and you can make very, very strong cordage. It's rather rigid, but it's still quite strong, strong enough for a fishing line or to even tie house posts with. Uh, on the west coast, cedar is very important. Another type of tree that provides a membrane like that, and you can make excellent cordage. But uh, cedar has specific qualities. It's rot resistant, so perfect for fishing instruments. People knew that, of course. Uh, and this one here, this sample here, is from a plant found all over North America. It's known as dog bait. Very supple, very strong, similar to cotton, maybe. It's hard to compare. And this was used for fishing nets and a great many things. But uh, I'll show you the plant. You may not recognize it. Of course, it's dry, it doesn't have any leaves. Believe it or not, this here, this dry stock, turns into that. Now, cordage is not a big mystery. People still make cordage today. But understanding which plants are you used for what uses is another story. Here's what I'm going to do. This is dried. It was collected in the fall. So it's kind of a hollow thing. And there's a similar plant that uh, we call milkweed, if you know that one. It's more common. So I'm cracking it here. Let's see if I can do this proper on the camera. And then it splits. It's kind of like a straw. Ooh. Oh, did you see that? Is that fiber that I see? Yes, fibers indeed. But they're not hiding inside. <laughs> it's more complicated than that. So I'm just going to split it in two like this. I'm gonna just put one half aside. Of course, both halves will make cordage. And now I've, I've got it hollow. See, this is the inside of it. Let me, yeah, there you go. Hi. And this is the outside. What I want is the bark. So there are specific ways to do this, but there are many ways. You have to understand in ancient times, there's no one way of doing things. This is the technique that I use. So I'm just gonna remove a piece of wood. This is useless, but See what I've got here. This is bark. The fibers are hidden in there. This is flexible. So I'm just going to peel this off. So let's see if I can do that properly right here. I 
Okay, so there are many ways of doing this. This is the way that I do it, especially in front of a camera. I have my usual setting here, but there, no more wood. What I've got here, it's bark. You see, it's all flexible, but uh, bark is not very good for cordage, at least not this type. So let's change it. Let's break it down. I'm going to fold this in two, so I have enough material. And since this is dry, it's the dry method. I'm going to rub it between my hands. Now the bark is very fragile. It just breaks down into dust. I'm going to show you that moment. There you go. See, this is the bark. So I'm basically breaking down the bark all along my uh, my fibers. So the fibers are all parallel. They're important that they stay so. I'm going to do that at both hands. I'm doing it rather quickly. If you want to do a really good job, you take your time because cordage is important. It's the difference between catching a fish and losing the fish. There we go. Okay, I'm going to show you that up close. Let's see. It's not very clean, but it will do. Now, what is cordage? Well, simply one of the oldest physical principles in humanity. I'm going to twist that, much like you would twist a towel if you want to try it. Wow. Okay, let's try with focus. I'm going to have some trouble here. I twist, I twist, then I kink it on itself. There you go. And I keep on twisting. So cordage is actually torsion. I don't have to be twisting anything myself. It twists itself as long as I give it torsion. Now look at that. There we go. So that's just a little bit of cordage there. But I could keep on going and add more fibers and make it hundreds of feet long if I wanted to. You just need a lot of plants. So this is the basis of fishing. And I would say the basis of a lot of things in humanity. You need fibers to tie things up. So fish hooks, sinkers, floats, lines. I'd say that's the most common fishing gear you can find anywhere. But of course, there are circumstances when fish are very, very large indeed, or when the water is not proper for line fishing. Uh, there are other tools you can use, which is these. These are also universal. And yes, once again, the oldest harpoon points made of bone that we find are dated uh, about 90,000 years old in Africa. So this is another type of technology that was understood a very long time ago. So what is a harpoon? Not very used nowadays. Uh, it's not very popular for the type of fishing that we do. And uh, many of them are actually illegal to use. But for experimental purposes, let's explain this. Uh, this is made of bone. It's a piece of a leg bone from a deer. Could be moose, elk, depends what people were hunting. Yes, fishermen were often hunters as well. So this is where they get the raw material. It has barbs on it. So this is a barb harpoon and it has many parts. Now we don't find all these parts in uh, the archeological record. Of course, they degraded a long time ago. But if we look around the world elsewhere, uh, we can get ideas from other people because there are not a thousand ways to make a harpoon, although there are several. So this is fitted with a string. Notice the string, very important. A harpoon usually has a string because this is not a killer piece. Yes, it will make a hole in a fish. Will the fish die? Maybe not, but it will be hooked. So it's kind of like a fishing line. It comes out. This is a detachable harpoon head. It comes out under tension and it's it stays on the line. Now there's another piece here that makes the joint between the point and the shaft. The shaft would be very long. I've got a short one here for the camera. This comes out as well and it's tight so you don't lose it. So the idea of our harpoon is actually quite simple. A little bit like a spear. You're just going to spear the fish. You push that point into a fish or a marine mammal, of course, anything that swims, that stays in. And if he's too big to retrieve, that's all right, there's a line. There's always a line between the fish and the fisherman. It could be tied to the shaft, could be tied to the person himself. Personally, I wouldn't do that if it's something very large, but basically a harpoon is a, a, a very aggressive fishing line where you strike the fish and you can retrieve it when it's tired, when it's possible, or if the fish dies, well, you don't lose it in the water. So this is a bar point made of bone. Bone has a problem, however. If you're fishing among rocks, that's very common in rivers and streams because to use a harpoon, you actually have to see the fish. So you're in shallow water. 
and you hit a rock with that, it's going to break instantly. Bone is hard. It is not strong. It will fracture. <laughs> if you've ever broken anything, this is how it works. The weak points are the barbs, and we find them in the archaeological record exactly this way, broken, where the barbs are. So is there an alternative? If I'm fishing uh, on a sand bank, yeah, that's all right. That's just going to dip into the sand. But rocks, hmm, another solution, perhaps. Let me show you this one. Now you're going to tell me, it's the same thing. Well, not quite. It is a barbed harpoon point, but it's not made of bone. There are alternatives in nature. This is made of antler. Antler is what everyone knows as this. Now, antler is a bony material, but it's definitely not bone. Ancient people understood the physics of antler. Animals fight with these things. So they're very, very strong indeed. Somewhat flexible, but mostly shock resistant. You can strike this point on a rock and it will not break. Oh, the tip might crush, of course. It's a rather softer material, but still fairly sharp. The only problem is that if you leave it in the water for very long, it will get softer. You will lose its sharpness. But this is not a fishing line. It's really just for striking. So in the archaeological record, we find antler barb points, bone barb points. And you know, if you don't understand harpoons, you're just going to say, well, you know, they're just two different materials. They're interchangeable. They were using one or the other, depending on what they have. The way I see it, when you test these materials, you realize that maybe they're more specific than that. They are not interchangeable. Uh, it, it depends where you're going to fish. People in ancient times returned to the usual fishing camps. You know, when you have a good fishing spot, that's where you go back. And they understand what they've got. They know if there's sand or it's rocks, where the fish are. And so tools are prepared for the circumstances. So I tend to believe that in many cases, antler and bone were two different choices. There were strategies that people were choosing to make things the most efficient possible. So these are barbed. Uh, what else is there? There's many other things. Now, this is also antler. There you go. It's the tip of an antler. It was drilled, you see, to fit in a stick. And there's a, there's a string, there's a line. There's always a line on these things but it's tied differently. You see, there's no barbs on this. You might ask, but how does that stay stuck in the fish? The line is near the middle. So what happens when you stick this into a seal or a very large fish, a sturgeon, I don't know, something like that? Well, it goes in, obviously, but then under tension, when the fish tries to leave the scene, oops, it toggles. This is a toggling point. There are many kinds of designs of toggling points. It's a very efficient, uh, design because a barb can rip the skin, come out, but a toggle, you see, stays stuck very firmly. It toggles. So that's about, let's say, that's a design that is known 8,000 years old from Newfoundland, Labrador. Of course, I'm sure it exists in other places. And I'll show you a more sophisticated one that uses the same principle. Back to the northwest coast, British Columbia. Uh, now you have this type of point. Let me show you here. I'm going to switch the image. Let's see. Where am I at? And on the right side, you see a fisherman that has uh, a harpoon with two of these points. Now, this is composite, a lot like uh, the fish hooks. Make use of the best materials. Uh, you have the point here, which is bone. Now, bone is hard, doesn't get soft in water. That's perfect for striking. And then you've got two antler valves here. Let me see if I can. Yeah, focus. Now, these are sharp, but uh, they don't have to be very sharp indeed. They are mainly to hold the bone point. It's all wrapped. There's resin on this to protect the, the lashing. And this goes through a fish, a salmon. Uh, and uh, when it goes on the other side of the salmon, you can imagine it, it doesn't just come out. There's two points. And since the attachment is right here, it's going to toggle. Let me move the stick there. There you go. Well, that's what you see in the drawing. Of course, these are just drawings. They're a bit fanciful, but this is how it works. And uh, you can have these uh, harpoons in uh, pairs or in threes or single. It actually depends where you fish. Uh, if you're fishing on a steep bank or uh, a flat bank or from above or a boat, it all depends where you're fishing. So people adapted the shapes of their harpoons to match the position of the fish and prevent, of course, damaging their equipment because this is rather sophisticated. It, this is not made in just a couple of hours. There are many parts 
to prepare and the assembly has to be very careful. People took time to make things well. Of course, that was their living. But just to say that you want to save your equipment, uh, you're going to design it well, so you damage it the least. And there is still another way to catch fish. I'm going to show you this. Often in English, it's called a leister. A uh, leister is a type of spear, harpoon, depends. Usually a harpoon has a line, this one does. And it has different parts to it. It has spikes. Now you have a uh, bone point in the middle. You have two more oriented, like opposite. So this is for striking fish. It comes with a long stick, naturally. I don't have that here. And uh, when you strike a fish with this, now the pressure forces the fish right down the middle and it gets impaled on this part here. Of course, it could just come down, fall back in the water, but it won't. The belly gets stuck on this. So it's a rather nasty design and a very sure way of securing a fish. It's also flexible because uh, you're going to have to get the fish out of there eventually. This one has a line. This one would be used for salmon because salmon is very heavy. And as you know, if you keep salmon dangling at the end of a long stick, you might actually break something. So you just, this releases and stays at the end of a line. You have a pivot point. Salmon can do whatever it wants. It's not going to break much. So this is a design found all over North America. It's hard to identify because the wooden parts have degraded. So this reconstruction is based on some examples that were documented. But uh, there's a local one year where I am in Quebec. Let's have a look at this one. This one is still known, the Inu, uh, people from the North Coast. Uh, some people still use them. Now, of course, in 2022, you can imagine many of these parts are in plastic, metal. Uh, you can use anything nowadays. Why not? But in ancient times, they would be made of wood, certain woods, and bone. Same principle, the fish is speared, it is forced down the middle onto the spike, and the size of the hole is designed for the fish which means that people don't just build harpoons and then go fishing. They actually know where they're going fishing, if they're a fishing spot. They know the size of the fish, they know what they want, they know what it looks like. So these are custom made. The size matters, the shape matters. It is meant to match specific circumstances. That's why fishing is so sophisticated. Uh, you need different types of harpoons for different situations if you want to be efficient. And it's all about efficiency. People are feeding themselves after all. So harpoons are good for large fish, surface fish, or migrations of fish. When the salmon are coming back, for example, or the eels, uh, there's so many of them that people would divert them using uh, stone walls and uh, fences and just drive them into pools and spear them out and make big provisions for the coming season. But uh, still, there is more to fishing than just that nets. Now we talked about cordage. Nets are very important because uh, you can catch a very large amount of fish in less time than you would with a, a fishing line. But uh, net, nets are a lot of cordage. So you can't really make a whole net. You see one behind me. Uh, this is a small sample. Uh, sample. They get much, much larger than that. Uh, you can do that on your own, but if you have to feed your family, uh, it's not a good idea, not very efficient. So it's a community thing. Many people would work on a net and making the net doesn't really take that much time. What does take time is the cordage. It's about 10 times longer to produce the cordage than making the net. So imagine you've got a village, a community, a group of people, they work together to make a net. And of course, you can't really handle it yourself. So you're going to need them as well to handle the net. You have to spread it out uh, in the river or across a stream. It depends where you are. And it's rather heavy because of the weight. It has to be weighted with stones. Uh, quite a few of them, if you look at this one. So that is a community thing. It's a group effort. You're going to catch a lot of fish with it. You can't eat them all yourself. So people work together and share the bounty afterwards. And there are tools to do that in a smart way. These are netting needles. Uh, these are still known today. They're made of metal and plastic. Fishermen still have to fix their nets, even if they buy them at the store. And uh, simple pieces of wood like that allow for the measurement of the mesh. 
Now the mesh is not random. You have to know what you're fishing. Are they large fish, small fish? Uh, you want the small ones to go through and grow up. You want the very large ones to go around and leave your net alone. So this, the mesh are actually calculated for the fish that you are looking for, a specific size of fish, which allows you to manage the fish population and still get food out of it. So the net needle or end gauge were used. Of course, they're made of wood. So in ancient times, you don't really find them. But in the past couple of hundred years, they were still in use. So we understand how these work. Now, it's just a matter of testing natural fiber nets and the stone sinkers and the wooden floats you can't see above there uh, and then see how that works. What's the difference with modern nets? How do you set them? How do they behave? These are the, this is information that we don't really have because no one uses these types anymore. So how do you make things? How do we make things to make sure that they are reliable as they were in prehistory? Well, you have to use the same tools. A fisherman is also a hunter. He's also a flint mapper. Of course, he has to make his knives, his tools. This is just a flake of something we call chirp. It's uh, a lot like flint. For those who know the word flint, uh, it applies to so many things, but uh, in North America, mostly it's chirp. So this is a flake. The fisherman made his knife, discarded a piece, but he kept it. Because if you're going to make a fish hook or a harpoon or any other thing out of bone, you're basically starting with this. Uh, you, could, you can't just smash the thing with a rock because it's going to break into a million pieces. Bones don't split, they, they just fracture in many ways. So say I want to make uh, two points out of this. This is a section of bone. It was cut the same way. There are no saws, but there are ways to use split and this is what people use. For example, if I want two points out of this and I don't want the bone to break out the wrong side, I'm simply going to use a burin, which is a type of tool that will allow me to score the bone. So basically, hard to do there in front of the camera, but the bone will be scored nearly to full cut and then split. And it will split properly according to the shape that I need. Most fishing tools uh, require abrasion. So flint is one thing. You also have to be a bit of a, ge a geologist and you're a fisherman in ancient times because you need all kinds of stone to work your bone, your antler. This is a rough stone. This is a sandstone. So if you want to sharpen a point or a fish hook or whatever else, you're going to have to be rubbing a lot. Basically, minutes, half hours, hours of rubbing to sharpen things. If you're efficient at it, it's not that long. People tell me, oh, they were so patient. Well, not really. If you're good at it, it's as fast as anything. And besides, this is their job. This is what they do. So it's not really a matter of patience. So this is the way things were made using stone tools. And as experimental archaeologists, this is what we have to do. There's no point shaping a harpoon with uh, a metal file and then testing it to understand how it used to work. Because to begin with, it wasn't done the proper way. So it's a matter of reconstructing the process from zero to how it works. How did they make it? Uh, that way you understand people better. You get to understand, go through the same steps that they made. How do you acquire bone? How do you work it? How do you carve it? How difficult is it? How much time does it take? It's the same problems for me as it was for people in the past. So that gives us a very deep understanding of how people, uh, how people were doing things and how they felt and how things worked uh, in their groups when they were working together. So I believe this is Almost everything. I will show you one last thing because I think I think I have one last minute. Stinkers. How do you groove a stone? How do you carve stone 5,000 years ago? No machines, of course, but if fishermen are indeed geologists as well, they know that some stones can be pecked and that other stones are much harder than these stones. So pecking, it's a tedious process. It's kind of fun. So I'm going to show you how that works. It's going to make a lot of noise. So basically, you pick your way around the stone. You can see all that dust. I'm going to stop doing that. <laughs> you pick all your way around and you've got a groove. And that secures your uh, sinker and makes sure you don't have to do another one the week after because you're going to retrieve it. So there are so many techniques related to fishing. It's not just about throwing a line and catching fish. It's also about the manufacture and production of all these tools 
that require scientific principles and understanding of the environment and craftsmanship skills. People were extremely skilled to make these things. And it's only when we try to replicate them today that we realize how much skill people have. So I'm afraid this is all the time I have to talk about fishing. We could go on for another week or two, but I think that's going to be enough for today. So thank you, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Martin, for this uh, incredible uh, presentation. Um, I now like to invite Erin uh, Richard uh, in her classroom from Nokomis School in Drake, Saskatchewan, to join us on the screen to meet Martin and ask him some questions. Are there technology? Are there technology improve fishing and help them catch more fish? I didn't hear that very well. Could you someone re repeat it near the microphone? How did technology improve fishing and help them catch more fish? Well, it definitely helped them catch more fish. If you have a community to feed, it's all about efficiency because you want the most fish possible. And if you can, you're going to make reserves. So all the things I've shown you, they didn't always exist. Things got developed engineering came into play so that things became more and more efficient for people to, to live well. They weren't starving. They were, they were living very well. And it's all thanks to these technologies that took thousands of years to develop. The same way we develop uh, technologies today using science. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> Which fishing technology has changed the least over the past years? Oh, well, then I would say the fish hook. I'll show you again. I had uh, one made of bone, oh, that one there. If you can recognize that as a modern fish hook, then this is thousands of years old. So I think this is a very efficient design, so efficient that no one needed to change it for so many years. So the fish hook would be, I think, the oldest one and the most efficient. How did they make the shape of the bone, I mean the hook? The shape of the whole, oh, okay. You mean uh, that very hook I just shown? I did, how they made the shape, is that what you mean? Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna show you something. It was an extra, I didn't have time, you're gonna get to see it. Now these are preforms. In other words, these are unfinished hooks that archeologists find. Sometimes people, they started their work and sometimes you do that too and you don't finish it and you just discard it or leave it there well sometimes they would drill a hole so i don't know if you can see that very well some were drilled with a stone tool and uh, others they were abraded in other words they would rub it against a rock until a hole formed in the middle so there's no one way to do this there's actually many ways you can drill it you can abrade it you can saw it too so there's uh, many ways but indeed you're right you do need to make a hole, and this is the tricky bit of making bone hooks. How did the change in hook design affect the indigenous way of fishing? A oh, good question. I, I think it would be the reverse. Uh, it's indigenous ways of fishing that changed hooks. So they actually probably uh, abandoned some types of hooks we've never seen and they developed new ones because say they moved to a different place or maybe the fish change. Say global warming for example, it changes things in the environment. Well in ancient times things changed too and people would design new types of hooks for new methods of fishing. So I think it's actually people changing and the environment changing that changes the hooks. If the water was deep, how did they catch the fish? I'm sorry, could you say that again? I didn't hear. If the water, how did they catch the fish? How did they if, catch the fish? If the water, if the water is deep, very deep, how, oh, how did they catch well, the fish? Well, the water is very deep. You just need a very deep, a long fishing line. 
Uh, but uh, I've seen illustrations of harpoons that were long enough to go very, very, very deep in the water. And people were above the water in a boat and they would, uh, they would strike from above and catch a fish maybe 30 feet deep. 30 feet is a lot. So basically, if the fish is very deep, you have two solutions. You have a very long instrument or you lure the fish to the surface. They had lures. I'll show you one there, another extra I didn't have time for. That looks like a badminton thing, doesn't it? <laughs> well, they would push that deep in the water with a long, long stick. And when you release it, it's wood, so it floats. But when it floats, it moves a certain way and fish chase it all the way to the surface where the fishermen are waiting with their spears and the harpoons. So you can do that. You don't have to go deep. You can lure the fish above and strike from there. Nice enough. Why does the harpoon need pressure to work? Ah, why does it need pressure to work? Well, that's a good one. Because uh, fish tend to be slippery and sometimes hard. Some of them have bone plates. So if you don't have pressure, the problem is that you won't be able to perforate the fish. So pressure really actually works to make a hole in the fish and for the point to go deep enough to stay in. So yeah, pressure is essential. A good strike will land a good fish. You can miss with a harpoon if you're not strong enough. When do you think the first people in Canada started fishing? Wow, well then I would have to say since the very beginning. As we say today, time immemorial. I've shown you a, a very simple hook that dates back from 90,000 years in Africa. Uh, indigenous people came at some point in time after that, I suppose. So you have to think that the very first humans, the very first people that came to America, they had fishing gear. They already knew how to fish. So let's say from time immemorial. This is our last question. Thank you. Uh how do they know fish was food? How did they know what? Was food. How did they know that fish was food? Oh, how did they know fish was food? Well, wow, I, that's a very strange question. I've never heard that one, but it's a good one. Well, I guess humans have been eating just about anything since the beginning, the beginning of humanity. So they understood that animals are edible. So I suppose you see something moving in the water and maybe you see bigger things uh, catching them, you know, their food. Say in Canada, for example, bears eat fish. I think it wasn't very difficult for people to understand that if the bear are catching and eating the fish, they could do the same as well. <laughs> so I think that's a very simple observation. And I would like to thank everyone for your very excellent questions. Thank you very much. Martin, um, we do have a couple of questions online, if I may, um, that I would like to, uh, to, to ask you. Um, the first one is, you know, what kind of artifact did you make for the movie Night at the Museum? We're just curious. Oh, uh, they, actually there were harpoons, a whole set of harpoons. Yes, there is a scene uh, where uh, Robin Williams, all the actors are staring at the skeleton of a triceratops, a triceratops that eventually charges them. And there's a display case, a red display case behind them. So they filled that with artifacts, replicas actually. And uh, some of these are harpoons. So my uh, carefully constructed harpoons are actually destroyed by a dinosaur in the movie. <laughs> I hope that wasn't too sad for you to see, especially based on all the time you've put into making them. <laughs> no, not too sad. They ordered so many that I figured they would break a few. <laughs> I see. Excellent. And there may be one last question. You know, of all these artifacts that you're able to make, is there a favorite one that you particularly enjoy making and why so? Hmm, that's a very good question. Wow, favorites. I like everything, but... Uh... I would go back maybe to this one, this uh, composite uh, toggle point. I like making it because it's very diff uh, delicate and difficult. I like going into details and this requires a lot of details. All the parts have to be very carefully carved so they fit well together. So uh, being the perfectionist that I am, I like the intricate ones like this. 
Excellent. Well, Martin, this is all the time we have. I would like to thank you again uh, for uh, this uh, fantastic presentation. Also, thank you very much to those very smart students who had these great uh, questions. So this brings the event to an end. Uh, I would like to uh, invite everybody to, to continue your, your science odyssey by coming to the website and looking at other types of activities like this one that are happening uh, in the coming days. Again, Martin, thank you so much, and I wish you all the best. Thank you, everyone.